Welcome to another episode of the Environment in Canada podcast, a podcast about the environment in Canada by Sierra Club Canada. I'm Jessica Murray, Sierra Club Canada's Ontario Director. Today, I have the pleasure of chatting with Owen Stewart, who sits as Sierra Club Canada's Board Vice President and is an Aboriginal rights lawyer living in BC, British Columbia. Today, Owen and I will talk about the current state of Aboriginal law in Canada, and Owen shares his insights on how Aboriginal rights might just be the best way to protect our environment. We also talk about reconciliation and unpack what that really means as we look forwards towards seeing Canada as a state with three heads, Anglophone, Francophone, and Indigenous. Before we begin, just a reminder that you can take action on environmental issues by visiting sierraclub.ca. We have tons of petitions, other actions and events, and regular new updates you can sign up for on the homepage. You can also find Sierra Club Canada on social media, and you can listen to the Environment in Canada podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio, and YouTube, or wherever you get your podcasts. Don't forget to click follow or subscribe so you can get the latest episodes from us. I hope you'll enjoy this conversation with Owen Stewart. Hello, Owen. How are you? Good. How are you? Not bad. Happy to be here. Oh, I'm so happy for you to be here too. Oh, and you've been so helpful for answering all of my questions. I know you're incredibly busy and you've always been so not only willing to chat with me about all of the issues, but also incredibly friendly and so easy to speak to. So I'm incredibly grateful for all of your support and really excited to have a conversation with you. Maybe we could just start with some introductions. So who are you? Where are you? Yeah, so I currently live in Campbell River, which is sort of a small town. It's roughly dead center in Vancouver Island in British Columbia on the East Coast. It's sort of the largest town for the northern half of the island, which gets quite uh, rural. Lots of, I mean, it's sort of classic coastal BC, you know, fishing, uh, mining and timber. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and so I'm I'm born and raised on the coast. Uh, I'm from Burnaby, which is a suburb in Vancouver. I've been lucky enough to live almost in almost every province in the country. Uh, I haven't been to Newfoundland or Manitoba yet, but it's on my list. And yeah, and so I'm I'm an Aboriginal rights lawyer. I've, I've been practicing for a few years now uh, in the field, uh, and I'm also the vice president of the Sierra Club too. I guess I should say that too. <laughs> Thanks so much. Yeah, I'm so super super excited to to talk to you about all of this. So I'm curious, It's a, you said you've been practicing Aboriginal rights law for the last three years. What's been your experience overall, just like as a general uh, view of your experience so far? I'm super lucky to be able to practice in the field. It, it, it often feels like you get to work for the good guys, which you don't always get to say practicing law. And just for me, like uh, I'm, I'm a huge nerd. I'm a sucker for uh, Canadian history. Uh, I'm a sucker for, like, I fish a lot, so I'm a sucker for sort of biology and environmental science, and I get to do a lot of that stuff in this field. Yeah, I know. It, it, uh, I'm, I'm reading old explorers' journals. I'm reading about Alexander Mackenzie. I'm, uh, I love this stuff, so, yeah. Very cool. And I'm not sure, like, are you allowed to talk about your cases? In general, <laughs> like, some parts of them I can, some parts of them I can't. Um, I can, in broad strokes, yeah. Sure. Why don't you tell us in broad strokes kind of what you're up to? Because I know you're very busy. I, what's what's coming down the immediate pipeline uh, is I'll be in court March 11th for a week. I'm one of the counsel involved in the new Chatlet Aboriginal title claim. We're uh, in year, I think, five now. Uh, we've been in court a couple of times and we're going back. We're nearing the end zone. And so I'm, I'm actually really I, I'm uh, excited for this hearing. I think we're going to put some really persuasive stuff before the judge and we'll have no matter what happens, we'll be pushing Aboriginal title law forward. Um, and I'm cautiously optimistic there'll be a, a good award for the client and for the for reconciliation, frankly. New Chatlet are a small First Nation on the west coast of Vancouver Island here. I had lots of interesting history. I mean, they were when Captain Cook made it to the to Canada, uh, it was Nooka Island where he stopped, and the New Chatlet are on, on northwest Nooka Island. So, uh, yeah, lots of interesting stuff there. Okay, so we need to backtrack. Who's Captain Cook? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Groki, great question. So this is where so much of Aboriginal law has to do with history. And I think if you take a very long view of Canadian history, there's these different sort of eras of sort of indigenous settler relations. And so Cook is the start, right? He's he's not the first uh, European to make it to the coast of the west coast of North America. I think the Spanish got there first, but he was the first British person there. 
there was a big controversy about who gets to colonize the West Coast. Does Spain get it? Does Britain get it? Who got there first? Who, you know, effectively occupied the territory? And then neither sort of did. But it, it's his his records end up being evidence. And so all of these sort of counters that are recorded in the historical record, and they're not the only sort of source of evidence, but they're a really important one. And so, yeah, that, or that long answer of Captain Cook, he was one of your your sort of classic uh, British explorers. He, he was the guy who got murdered in Hawaii. I think he, he, you know, went all over the world. Your sort of classic, uh, yeah. Actually, I've got his, I got his complete journal in the office here. Does he count as a colonizer? Good question. Explorer, yeah, probably. So, um, it it colonizer. Yeah, I suppose he never like set up a fort or anything, but he definitely was the like planting the flag, you know, which is the the one of the first steps to making a territorial acquisition. We can talk about this. Uh, that I'm I'm sort of fascinated by this law. The Terra nullius we can talk about if we got time today. Oh, yeah. um, and just the law is sort of, uh, it's a common myth, I think, in Canada. Terra nullius isn't real. Um, it never existed in Canada. What? Uh, no, 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 no. Okay, backtrack first. What yeah. is Terra nullius? We so terra nullius is fancy Latin for, uh, what does it mean? Terra means earth, nullius means empty. Mm -hmm. So it's the idea, it was an empty land, right? Any first person to go there gets to own it because uh, native folks didn't use it and weren't, you know, people. Mm. Uh, and it often gets thrown around as as the sort of the foundation of North America was this terra nullius myth. And it's not true. And and Canadian courts have said it's not true uh, in multiple decisions uh, from the Supreme Court of Canada to lower courts. Um, and I think it's true used picking the history if it was true why would canada have bothered signing any treaties with anyone if the, if the land was just there to take because they knew that there were people there who were using it who owned it and they needed to at least do something to justify taking it either declare a war or sign a treaty and because they knew that it wasn't this this sort of empty land this terra nullius myth now the myth still has had a huge impact in north america of course it has and unfortunately it's, it's quite pervasive many people think it's real but it but at law it's not Absolutely not. And I think uh, you see that through the at least historic government actions and, and more modern uh, case law. So, Right. Because if you're going to recognize that you need something to be done, then clearly it was, yeah. it was actually empty. If we did. Yeah. If we had. If, why would we bother signing these treaties? If we could just take it. Right. If at law we could just take it. Why bother buying it? And the same thing, right? Like if I could just take that car, why would I bother giving somebody money for it? Mm -hmm. um, because they knew somebody owned it and somebody was using it. In fact, there were commissions that the federal government or the, the British government at the time created to go, you know, meet with the chiefs, find out who the proper owner is and roughly what their territory is. And then let's figure out who, let's figure out what the details of the treaty is going to be. And these commissions came back and said, okay, these guys are the rightful owners and this is roughly their land and these are the people who we need to treat with. And so they wouldn't have done that if Terra Nullius was real. They just would have taken it. And even the American example is the same. Like they, they declared wars as sort of their experience. Custer's last stand and things like that. They also signed treaties and then broke them. But uh, they wouldn't have gone through this sort of legal process of war making if Terra Nullius was real. Like why bother? Just take yeah. it. Um, and then I think maybe like another added complexity of looking at geography for the First Nations is that there's really a lot of overlap too. Like they don't, I, from my understanding, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, they don't, they didn't understand borders the same way that like we've carved out the world. You know, there's not like, oh, like here's the line. And if you step on the other side, you're in another country, you're in another country or another province, right? Here it was a lot more alliances and shared spaces and kind of a lot more like, I think, collaboration and cooperation. Does that sound about right? So it, it depends. I I think it it like in, I'm gonna have to give a lot of lawyer, lawyerly answers. It where, depends. Um, yeah, where it, it um there are very different. I think like we're talking about a, a continent's worth of cultures, right? And mm -hmm. they're gonna vary wildly from the west coast to the east coast to the middle. And so it, my experience looking at a lot of the anthropology is that on the west coast here there were very clear territorial boundaries okay. that were readily understood and everybody recognized you knew where the border was Interesting. Um, okay. and i think um that also would have existed in other places in the country but there also would have been sort of places of shared ownership it, it i often think it it's valuable to compare what like europe wasn't this sort of perfect modern nation state thing until really the 1800s, right? Like there wasn't really a common language in France until they had public schools. 
someone would speak Burgundian and in, in that province and then speak someone else, something else in Normandy. And so they wouldn't necessarily be able to communicate that clearly. And that it's sort of what it would have been like, I'm sure in Canada, there would have been uh, like a, like a trade language. Um, and then uh, as you sort of spread out, there would have been varying uh, levels of sort of organization and government, I mean, just like anywhere, sort of every, everyone, people are members of communities in both higher and lower orders. You get, you get up to like a nation state, but then there's even higher than that. Is like, there? Uh, well, NAFTA, what, oh, what, uh, right. or even, uh, right. Um, or, uh, uh, what's the real topical one, the military alliance in, uh, the North Atlantic that Trump wants to pull out of, or is threatening to pull out of, uh, the UN or another example, right. The, the, mm-hmm. There are these sort of higher, you know, uh, uh, meta organizations. First Nations would have had that too. There would have been a sort of local sort of government, uh, style of sort of higher head of government and then a confederacy sort of order of government, I think traditionally. But again, we're talking in broad strokes, so it's a long way of saying it depends. <laughs> <laughs> and I have a feeling that's going to be a lot of the response that you give me. So uh, just for our listeners, Owen's been very good at always splashing cold water onto my face when I feel like I have gotten an idea <laughs> that might be helpful. Oh, but it's Yeah, like- <laughs> well, it, it, I mean, it... it uh, I, you never want to, I mean, lawyer never comes to you with good news. <laughs> he'll, he'll usually just don't say, don't do that. But, uh, but it is, uh, I think there, there's a lot of passion in this field and a lot of rhetoric that gets thrown around. I think it's, it is very valuable to sort of sit down and, and sort of run through, uh, some of the things that are out there is, you know, what, what is the strongest path forward? What are we trying to aim? What are we trying to achieve? And what are the tools to get it? Sure. Um, so I have a question actually, just come back because we're talking about borders and boundaries and the kind of acknowledgement from the Canadian government or, you know, the early settlers that people were living here, they were controlling and also owning the land, whether you want to call it stewardship or, or what have you. My next question is, is like, in a lot of the discourse, even now, like if you go on the governmental website, it, ta- it really says that it recognizes First Nations bands as sovereign nations. And so when there's, we talk about, let's just, let's go back to like the United States and Canada. Sometimes when we're talking about a resource that is shared, or there's kind of like something where operations are kind of mixed together, there's sometimes something called jurisdiction that comes up. So then it's like, whose laws prevail? And so my next question is kind of like, okay, well, if we're recognizing that the First Nations are a nation, I mean, it's it's called First Nations, so you really kind of, it's all kind of really, really folded into there itself. What is going on? Because, you know, let's go to, let's say the Wet'suwet'en issue right now. They, from their perspective, they're like, we're upholding our laws. And then Canada's coming in saying that, like, you know, kind of different things is a bit confused. So I'm wondering if we can peel that apart a bit, because if we're going to call something a nation and it's within their geographic location and jurisdiction, what in the world is going on? Yeah. So I I think you've got two questions here. One is sort of what is a nation? uh, And then the second is uh, what happens in a situation where you have conflicting laws? And so I, I think the, the I'm going to answer the second one first, the conflicting laws question. It, it's a great question. Nobody quite knows. Um, we're 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 in a early days in terms of the resurgence of indigenous law, and what exactly those laws are and how they interact with the rest of sort of Canadian society. We don't exactly know. There will be moments of conflict for sure. And there are already rules that exist to determine this, just in the same way that there are constantly fights between municipalities and provinces and between provinces and the federal government. There tends to be an order, a hierarchy of whose law wins. And so generally, the higher order of government wins. Province trumps municipalities. Federal government trumps the province. Constitution trumps everybody. How Aboriginal law fits into that hierarchy is unknown at this time. And there will be different uh, ways that Aboriginal law interacts with different laws. For instance, I think it's going to be hard for any Aboriginal law to supersede the criminal law, for instance. But others, there will be tons. I I think there will be room and we're going to, it'll be an interesting uh, sort of future as there's push and pull between different heads of government to find out where these boundaries are. I I think a very clear uh, way forward for sort of Aboriginal law to grow and develop is how it applies both on reserves and sort of on traditional owned lands by a given band, how those Aboriginal laws start to interact when they come into conflict with the province or the federal government. It'll be interesting to see what happens. I think an interesting background piece that you sort of constantly have to be aware of when talking about Aboriginal law and sort of Aboriginal heads of government is the division of powers in the Canadian constitution. It's super dry and boring stuff, right? You go back to high school social studies, 
you know, some powers are given to the federal government. They get international relations and the army and criminal law. Uh, and then some powers are given to the provincial government to control. And they get property, which is generally the big one that the province gets. And they each get to the power to give taxation. There is no express sort of heads of power for Aboriginal governments in the Constitution. But that doesn't mean that there isn't space for Aboriginal governments to sort of fill voids that are left. One of the big things that's not in the Constitution is who has jurisdiction over the environment. Um, and it's sort of a constant fight about who who gets to rule on the environment. And because of that gap, I think that it's a, it's a huge uh, void that leaves jurisdiction for Aboriginal heads of government to have a lot of power. And we can talk later about uh, the relationship between Aboriginal rights and environmental protection and how I think they're some of the strongest tools for environmental protection in the country. But it's, yeah, you sort of have to know that uh, they're... they're the division of powers, sort of what government gets to do what, isn't a perfect box. There are these things sort of set out in the Constitution, um, but there are gaps between them. And there's nothing expressly given to, to First Nations, which leaves, I think, a lot of room for them to be creative and to develop their own sort of Aboriginal laws and practices. Now, the second question, what is a nation? That's a really tough one. And I, I would actually say that I, I think most bands effectively are nations at this are, point. Are not, sorry, are? They, are nations. Yeah, they're not necessarily functioning or uh, flexing their powers yet as nations, but the power is there for them. Um, and it's already recognized, I think, by the Canadian state. Now, it, it, like, what is a nation? That's a complicated question. I think you'd be hard pressed to find a clear, super clear answer on that. Even within Canada, right? I think the Parti Québécois says Quebec, Quebec is a nation, right? Within Canada, they're their own nation. And so then other provinces are, are sort of nations within nations. It, it, this gets back to the sort of we're all communities within communities within communities. Sure. Um, and so the question is, what power comes with a nation? And so if Quebec is a nation, they get these express powers to control property and emit taxes and things like that. Well, bands already have those powers. Um, they can control. They can control property on reserve. They can tax members on reserve. Bands also have power that extends beyond reserves, and this is their Aboriginal and treaty rights. To generally recognize some uh, right to hunt and fish and trap, um, and to be able to hunt and fish and trap, you need a relatively pristine environment. So there are sort of powers I uh, think that bands in this country already have at their disposal that are effectively the powers that nations have. Now, they, can they can they form an army? No, but neither can the province. I mean, there are bands that have uh, their own police force. So I, I think the 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 nationhood question I think can quickly fall into rhetoric, but I think if if you mm. peel away at it, the power is there for them. It's just we're in this growth period where they're sort of you know puffing their chest out and filling in the space that's there. Um, it hasn't been recognized, and and you know the crown has been fighting it for the last hundred and fifty years. But I, I think the power is there for them to be considered nations, at least as a head of government that's similar to provinces. Interesting, and and I think in some ways. Considering there's been so many so much conflict between the federal government and uh, you know different First Nations all all across Canada, I find it particularly interesting that the judiciary has quite like space there to really kind of develop the space that you like like you say is kind of open and then really unclear as to where we're going. It's I guess it's the profession tooting its own horn, but I, I do think our judiciary deserves some credit. Mm. There are some significant wins for First Nations rights uh, in the last sort of twenty or thirty years. Where, I mean, God, if you were in a South American court, you couldn't have been able to bring this kind of thing. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I do think some credit is some due and, and and credit due to to the clients who push these cases forward. I mean, it, it takes a, a, a brave First Nation to, you know, put their credibility on the line and, and fight for these things. Um, it, mm -hmm. It's not just the court, too. It, it's the clients as much as anything else. For sure. Um, so recently I, I listened to the Wet'suwet'en and Hereditary Chiefs talk about what they've been going through. And. It was really incredibly moving. I'm just I'm just really floored by their level of engagement and activism, considering, you know, like the rates for what they're experiencing are are really horrifying. Really, it's heartbreaking and tragic. So so the fact that they've been able to find the resilience and strength and kind of organization to really come at this and the funding like, you know, I, I actually don't know how much this kind of stuff costs. Maybe you can you can fill me in. But it's not cheap to start these legal wars with the federal government, which has, you know, a lot of whether you call, I, th I guess you'd call it political power. So and I. I, I want to stop you there because like yeah. you're right, it isn't cheap, but I also think that's not necessarily an accurate narrative. Okay. I think that gets thrown around as a way to uh, uh, inhibit some court cases, frankly. Um, okay. And I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, the legal profession, you know, charges an arm and leg for their services for sure. 
but so let's talk about the Chilcotin case, for example, which I which I know quite well. That didn't cost the Chilcotin First Nation a, a penny. Um, okay. They didn't pay a single thing for it. Uh, and it gets quoted, I think it cost $20 million or something over 50, 20 years, some crazy number. They didn't pay a penny. There's something called an advance costs order, which is rarely you know awarded at law. But in rare cases, you can get it and it's where the the opposing side pays your lawyer's fees ahead of time because you know there's some genuine. I mean, there's there's a number of factors to it. So there are there are times when uh, this isn't crazy expensive. Now that's not to say it's not a large endeavor and it takes a lot of willpower and research and time and mm-hmm. frankly intelligence and creativity. But it it, it uh, I sort of push back against the everything's all so expensive. These things are so expensive. Narrative. It's like they are, but. It, they're in the big picture in the relative scheme of things are they're, they're not and there's ways to make them cheaper frankly and i think they are getting cheaper as there are more wins uh in the court is that um, specifically for aboriginal rights law or are you saying that in general for the legal system advanced costs or yeah so i think it's available generally for the legal system but okay. it's a high bird it's a high bar to get it okay. uh Cost is a thing in court where generally if you win, yeah. um, the other side pays your legal fees or a portion of them. Mm-hmm. And so by awarding costs ahead of the actual end of a trial, the court can sort of seem like it's a picking a winner already. And they don't yeah. want to do that. You don't pick a winner before the end of a trial because you got to hear everyone. You got to hear both sides, right? You got to yeah. weigh the evidence. So it, it's rarely awarded, but it is a thing that's available. Look at you. You've got good news. Oh no! It it, it uh, <laughs> I think the Aboriginal rights field is, is one of the places to look for for good news in sort of environmental law, or not just the Aboriginal sort of rights, but just Aboriginal reconciliation, Aboriginal parks projects. Uh, I think there there there's a lot of exciting stuff happening. Yeah, I'm I'm actually curious. So when you work with the client that I assume is is always like the Aboriginal band, do you ever come across kind of when their laws are kind of also guiding what you are going to say in the Canadian judiciary court? Absolutely. So one of the, we can get into the weeds of Aboriginal title. So it, it, it can be evidence. Absolutely. Um, one of the ways that you own land at a territorial level is to sort of assert an intent to own it. And what does that mean? What is inserting an intent? Well, it's basically making rules for how people access and use things. And those are indigenous laws there. And so if you have those laws either sort of recorded orally through oral history uh, or written in the anthropology or recognized elsewhere, yeah, it's evidence. Absolutely. Very cool. Okay. And and from your exposure of indigenous law, and and, and when I say indigenous law, let's, let's just like for the purpose of this conversation, call indigenous law, like their laws, like the laws within the band, and then aboriginal laws kind of like the laws within the Canadian legal mm-hmm. framework. So just to have like, I don't know what- no, no, yeah, yeah. That, that's, that's probably easy. a fair way to split yeah? it, yeah. Yeah, so what would you say if you've had exposure? Like, can you speak to the difference between Indigenous versus Aboriginal law? You know, it's a good question. I, I can't say I've ever thought thought of it. It-, it... It's hard. it's sort of impossible to generalize, I think, about Indigenous law mm-hmm. um, uh, or, or, you know, uh, Indigenous laws that may exist is there are, I think there's over 600 bans in the country. Mm-hmm. So does that mean there are over 600 different Indigenous laws? Maybe. I don't know. Or are there, or is is what we're talking about become more sort of overarching principles and less sort of specific law as legislation? I don't know. Yeah, it's a good question. Cool. You talked earlier about good news in the world of Aboriginal law. Can you highlight a story for me that you think is going really, like as an example of like something to celebrate? Oh, I mean, I, I would highlight uh, the New Chatlet case. I, I think it's, um, it, you know, it's a David and Goliath fight between a, a small First Nation uh, and, and the province of British Columbia mostly. And hopefully it'll it'll be a David and Goliath fight with a with a big victory at the end. I, I, the Chilcotin decision is a big success. There's been a number of decisions on the coast here. The Ahousa decision has been a big success for sort of commercial Aboriginal fishing rights. This hotel decision has been a success for uh, recognizing uh, sort of tr- international transborder Aboriginal rights. Yeah, it, it, lots of sort of good things. And it's outside of court, too. There's a project that's sort of close to home here called Salmon Parks. It was uh, founded. The idea was came up by uh, New Chatlet's former chief, Walter Michael. It was his idea. Um, and I, I love the concept. I like to fish a lot. 
Uh, and it's the sort of you need a, a land-based park to protect an ocean-based species. And it's it really kind of breaks down dichotomies, I think, in protection. And it is an indigenous sort of led park. I forget what the principle is. I'm going to mispronounce it. It's Hishish Tsawak, which is a new channel word that means everything is interconnected. Everything is one. Mm. Um, and I think it's a great way to, to think of uh, animal management and sort of environmental management. It's very uh, ecological, it seems. Sure. And wouldn't you say... That, at least from my exposure, seems to be kind of the, like when we talk about differences in perspective in terms of understanding the environment, the, the main thing that I've really gotten across in terms of relating with First Nation people is they seem to really understand this, like, like not, I wouldn't even just call it connectivity, that it's just like, it's all, not just that it's all connected, but it's like one living, breathing organism together. And there's like no chopping things up and like, this is over there and this is over here. Yeah, so that's a great. Um, I completely. Or I. I guess I. I don't know that I. I would say that it, uh, every indigenous group I've met has that has that viewpoint. But I. I completely agree that that is the sort of classical European view of nature. It's this very sort of traditional view of parks, which is you know you stick the park in, people can't go in there anymore because people aren't natural. Na- <laughs> nature is natural. No, but absolutely, and this is how parks were run for hundreds of years, right? Yeah. I mean, it really comes from this, I think, classic medieval, you know, this, the King's Park is where he gets to hunt or no one else is allowed in there because it's a park. And it's even a black and white dichotomous thinking, which is often very European, I think. And it's had a negative impact for sort of environmental management because we had hundred years worth of parks where I think people don't get to go in there. It, you can have, have a long chat about parks legislation in Canada and this sort of constant tension between preservation and recreation that, that is a, a constant pressure in all the parks. Yeah, we do, I definitely experienced that myself, too, as like a rock climber when we go outside. I mean, one case in point right now is uh, Bon Echo. I don't know if you're familiar with um, on, Ontario, because I know you're on the West Coast, but at Bon Echo, Echo there's a Mazinaw rock. And, you know, there's there's a lot of, uh, I think they I think they're called petroglyphs, but there's there's, you know, there's art. And, you know, there's a lot of sacredness to those sites. And it's a uh, definitely an issue of contention you know we've on t- for for whatever reason even though th- these and same with the petroglyphs park I, g- I guess also in ontario so it's like it's i find it very peculiar that like these sites clearly have indigenous aboriginal markings on them and yet it's an ontario park and the ontario park gets to decide what's happened what happens to it totally so a great example is uh Banff, right it was uh you put Banff national park in you kick all the native folks out because it's a park now. Nature can't be in there messing with it. Uh, <laughs> but they can come back in once a year for the parade kind of thing, right? Which is which is kind of what happened. And it is this sort of false idea that we talked about Terranellius earlier, that this was just this kind of, you know, beautiful empty landscape that where people could just sort of pick pluck fruit off the trees and live harmoniously. No, um, this was a heavily managed and heavily used landscape. There, there would have, you know, it would have been as fully occupied as it could have been supported through people's use. There were big populations of people here pre-contact, especially on the West Coast. Yeah. Um, they they figure it would have been, uh, uh, I mean, the Great Lakes would have had huge populations too, uh, just enormous in the pre-contact, yeah. Yeah. Really, really interesting stuff. Okay. I kind of want to switch gears when you talk about there's, so there's, there's rights for the indigenous that are living on reserve. And then now an issue that I've kind of seen more in the cities is that the reality is that maybe perhaps, and maybe you can explain to me why there, why there's so much poverty and challenge and kind of like issues with drinkable water, for example. And so a lot of the First Nations people have actually started going towards the urban centers. Um, and in Toronto, where, where I live, it's, it's become an issue where, you know, you come to Toronto and it's like, even if this is a site that your people used to connect to, and here I'm thinking about Mount Dennis area, Eglinton Flats area by the Humber River, in that way, because they're no longer on reserve, they don't have any rights in, in terms of like protecting their access to these spaces. So I'm curious to know what your thoughts are in terms of, you know, rights for urban indigenous. Yeah. So, I, I mean, it, everyone's moving to cities. It, like, mm-hmm. Small towns across the country are all, all shrinking. It, it, it's an international phenomenon, I think. Rights for urban indigenous people is, is, I mean, my first question ends up being, well, what kind of right? Because there, there are all sorts of things sort of beneath the umbrella of Aboriginal rights. It, it, they can be used in many different ways. If we're talking about, let's like a right to hunt moose or something that, that um, while it's a real right, I think you would be hard pressed to 
have any effect with that, right? It's not like you're going to, no judge is going to tear down Toronto, right? Uh, that's too much of an ask. But there is, there would still be, even if you are an inter- urban indigenous person, you have the right to exercise your right elsewhere, the right to exercise a, a treaty right or an Aboriginal right uh, outside of the city. Now, there are ways that um, Aboriginal rights can be exerted, I think, in an urban s- setting. Um, it's just complicated as to how. And it really does depend, I think, on the treaties that may have been signed in each place. It's sort of a, a it's a long way of saying it depends. <laughs> <laughs> Look, speaking of treaties, I mean, I, I even just in understanding it, it seems like there's even a disagreement of like whether treaties sometimes were signed or not. Can you kind of speak to that as to what's going on there? Yeah. So there's a long history of treaty signing in the country. It goes back to, the you know, before Canada, I think 1600s is some of the first treaties. And the, the sort of historic treaty process runs up until 1920. So almost 300 years worth of treaty signing. And they changed a lot sort of throughout history uh, as the relationship between the First Nations and the uh, British Canadian governments changed. Generally, the treaties all involve a surrender of territory. It, the treaties are what the, the Crown would rely on to say that we bought your land from you. Um, and you still have a bunch of rights sort of on the land that has been surrendered. But ultimately, it's now the Crown's and we can you know do with it what we will. I, a lot of these treaties were signed in suspicious circumstances, and I've done a fair bit of treaty work, and some of these treaties, frankly, stink. They, I think if you challenge them in the moment, they would maybe, some of them would be unconscionable bargains, right? Mm-hmm. It's it's sort of gun to your head stuff sometimes. That said, I think you'll be hard-pressed to ever overturn a treaty. Like, you'd need really, really clear evidence. So mm-hmm. much, I mean, there's 150 years worth of, worth of decision-making uh, that is based on these treaties as being valid documents. It would need to be something enormous to overturn that. And mm-hmm. I also think the treaties actually end up being a better tool to protect Aboriginal rights. Um, because they they do enshrine protection in them. Well, there, well, there is a land cessation sort of element to all of them, they also all include protection for hunting and fishing and trapping rights. And so this is how Aboriginal rights end up being such powerful environmental protection tools. To have a functioning right to trap a wolverine, you need enough wolverine to be able to trap, to have some to kill, right? And so to have a surplus of wolverine, you need a healthy environment that keeps enough wolverine around. And that it gives you great leverage in terms of development, even in territory that's been ceded under treaty. So yeah, that's right. I'm a, I'm a big believer in Aboriginal rights as uh, as powerful environmental tools. Okay, interesting. Because I don't know. It's just I find let's let's kind of go back to what's happening in Ontario at Chalk River. And uh, if if our listeners aren't aren't familiar with the topic, uh, there was a podcast I think a few weeks ago now with Ola Hendrickson, and he's been working with I can't remember how many bands it is, but a handful of bands that have said no to a near surface disposal facility for Canada's first radioact permanent radioactive waste facility and they've been very outspoken that and in some ways it's kind of bizarre to me because it's like they, this has ha- been happening for years you know and, and they've kind of had their stories of oh we found a moose that has you know they find i think it was like there was too much blood and there was blood in its stool so like clearly issues where it's like okay well you know the radioactive waste has caused harm to the animals and <laughs> all very you know very uh funnily points out like well you can't tell the moose not to go outside of the boundary so it's like yeah. All these, like this idea of this carved up landscape of boundaries, and this really falls apart once you start looking at wildlife, right? It's like, especially when there's like my world. I'd say it depends on the boundary, right? Um, Mm -hmm. I think there are lots of European boundaries that are natural boundaries too, right? It's It's the river, it's the height of land. And generally in broad strokes, that ends up being what the boundaries are between First Nations territories in the country. It ends up being natural boundaries, things that are easily identifiable that, you know, no one can, no one's going to miss the middle of the river, right? Everyone knows that's the end of the territory or, or the Rocky Mountains or something like that. And so there are examples where there are, those are, you know, valid boundaries in Canada, but the country was made in this sort of era of of just agreed upon boundaries, like the, you know what is it the oh god what's the American border the not the forty ninth parallel is it the forty oh it is the forty ninth parallel woof um, <laughs> the forty ninth parallel how did they pick that well they didn't want to fight about what the natural boundaries were uh, because it can be kind of vague what a natural boundary is on the plains right how do you tell what the height of land is in Saskatchewan and so they just agreed upon a number let's just pick the forty ninth parallel perfect straight line. And that's when you get these sort of traditional territories that are split up because it was this negotiated boundary. It's not based on this sort of natural thing. 
I'm kind of like also tying it into resources though. So if you're talking about hunting and trapping, like let's say the animal, like let's even say like an animal is on one side of the boundary and there's, you know, there's some sort of toxic whatever that's happened there and it travels into the indigenous territory where they're hunting and trapping and they're getting sick and so forth. Is, is that kind of the premise of the Wet'suwet'en kind of claim in some ways? Because like, I think from my understanding, they're almost quite broad stroke saying like the federal government has not been responsible in tr- keeping the global temperatures, like their their decisions have not been aligned in, a, in alignment with those agreements. So yeah, is that kind of what the premise of their argument is? Like- so I, I, I gotta say, I, I don't know. Um, I'm mm-hmm. not directly involved in, in the case or the claim. I'm aware of it. And I, I'm actually I'm quite fairly knowledgeable about, so the Wet'suwet'en were involved in an Aboriginal title claim, uh, the Delgamut case, which is very famous for uh, the first case that sort of said oral hi- oral test, oral test histories are valid testimony. Like this, mm-hmm. this is real evidence or it can be real evidence. And so the Wet'suwet'en were half, uh, there were two different First Nations involved in that case and the Wet'suwet'en were one of them. And I think this is a great example of um, what happens when being in British Columbia, the question of who owns the province is, is, is huge. It's essential, right? There's no almost no treaties in BC. Mm. And this is what happened. The current problem in Wet'suwet'en territory is what happens when this problem isn't solved in the court case 40 years ago. They brought this claim forward in the court. It goes all the way to the Supreme Court of Canada and they sort of say, you know, the lower court judge made a mistake. We can't make a new mistake, but you obviously need a new trial. And so they've never had this new trial to, to whether they have Aboriginal title in this region in sort of northern central BC. And if if the court had answered this question 40 years ago, we would know. Uh, and there wouldn't be this fight in Wet'suwet'en right now, which is which is bad for everyone, frankly. I, I think uh, uh, everybody loses uh, with what's going on up there. It's a shame. Why do you say that? I think there's value to to win or lose. I'm, there's value to having certainty. Who owns the land is worth knowing. And I, I think the First Nations will own it. They'll have a property right in it. But even if they don't, if this, is a, this, this has been a question for 150 years. It's about time somebody answers it and we can move on. Um, <laughs> but I, I, but it, like, what, what that answer is and what it, what moving on means is is a complicated thing. But it, it uh, I mean, maybe I'm being young and naive, but it's like, we got to do something. Otherwise, we end up in fights like this, right? We end up with protest people on the street, people getting arrested. It's mm. somebody, someone will get hurt sooner or later, frankly. Well, uh, it sounds like they already have. It sounded like uh, when they were protesting, they actually sent the RCMP in. Yeah. The RCMP were quite violent with the arrests from, from you know, their accounts. Yeah. No, no, it's a breakdown yeah. of civil society. It's not. Anyway, it, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm a supporter of Wet'suwet'en for sure. It's a shame. I actually, I have a great book called Colon- Colonialism on Trial, Colonization on Trial, and it's this beautiful uh, sort of newspaper clipping scrapbook following the Delgamook uh, trial decision in in BC. Uh, it was a, the new Vancouver. It was one of the first trials in the new Vancouver courthouse. It, it's got a lot of history. The Chief Justice overheard it. It's a really interesting case. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to kind of come back to big picture as we kind of get closer to the time that we are up. So I was kind of like you know looking at my Aboriginal Law One Hundred One Section Thirty Five of the Constitution Act, and at least this is off of the government website as of now, it says, quote unquote, promise that indigenous nations will become partners in confederation on a basis of a fair and just reconciliation between indigenous peoples and the crown. And so from my kind of reading of that, I'd be curious to know your perspective. I Things that come up for me in understanding that is like self-determination and self-governance. And I'm curious, uh, like when I read that to you, like what do you think is like the core there? Self-determination. I mean, my, my brain goes to reconciliation, the word reconciliation. Uh, it, um, I'm a, I'm a sucker for it and I still believe in it. Uh, what does it mean? I, let's, uh, let's like define complicated. So uh, <laughs> there's different meanings to it. And unfortunately the concept is being ruined and watered down um, mm-hmm. by uh, uh, both all heads of government seem to want to put every agreement they sign with the first nation. They call it a reconciliation agreement, uh, reconciliation agreement, sign this reconciliation agreement. That's mm-hmm. absolutely ruining the concept because these are not reconciliation agreements I don't think most of the ones that I've seen I, I've spoke to First Nations folks who who call it reconciliation with a WR rec like WRECK and reconciliation. reconciliation yeah which is a shame because I think it is an important concept and it is uh it is sort of a, a guiding light for for future relations in the country. No, I think reconciliation isn't a, isn't an end zone. It's a process, and it's a process that involves give give and take from both sides, right? It's this it's this 
I mean, the country is really a merging of three societies. It, it's it's Francophone, Anglophone, and, and Indigenous. Um, mm-hmm. And we're working on the sort of Indigenous part. And I do think it is, it's important to remember that it is a process. I mean, it's taken us 300 years to get to this point. Reconciliation isn't going to happen in my lifetime. It'll be the next, uh, or maybe the one after. Um, it'll be a long process. If we could kind of try to nail down a definition of what that process is, could you try to attempt that? And I'll try to be the midwife. So it's a merging of sort of indigenous and in, in Canadian or Euro-Canadian um, legal concepts in societies. It's it's uh, I think it's a question of recognizing the promises that were made and the relationship that existed at the start of the country. I really think when Canada was sort of created, there is a hundred years, hundred and fifty years of alliance between First Nations and, and the British Crown. Really, isn't until the nineteenth century that the worst sort of, I mean, not the worst effects, but the really kind of overt uh, modern colonization begins, and and the relationship changes, uh, and, and Indigenous peoples mm-hmm. and interests and needs become much more subservient. But that first hundred years is how the, when the country was founded. First hundred years, there's current legislation that sort of has roots in that first hundred years, and I think. We're we're moving towards a relationship that is more equal, that is more like those first hundred years than it has been like the last hundred and fifty years. It's going to take a long time, and that isn't really a definition of reconciliation. But I, but I think it can help sort of paint a bit of a picture of it. Sure. Um, from from me understanding what you said, it kind of sounds like an openness to be influenced by kind of the somewhat right now separate bodies of law where it's like we actually recognize their laws and maybe are even influenced and adopt some of them. Is that kind of... Oh, uh, I think we already have. I, I think it's a constant disservice, I think, done to First Nations across the country, how much of sort of Canadian culture, quote unquote, is borrowed from from Indigenous people. I mean, you think of any any sort of Canadian iconography, canoes, beavers, like these are all Indigenous things, right? I, canoes even an Indigenous word, I think. Mm. Um, kayaks, right? Like all this stuff. Uh, I, I think uh, we don't quite recognize how much was shared with first, from First Nations to sort of can- broader Canadian culture. Interesting. It's almost like we've taken like the thrust of colonization even into those language pieces of those named items like canoe. Oh, Manitoba I, is an indigenous word. I mean, British Columbia is not. <laughs> we, no, definitely not. It's something we got to work on. But uh, Ontario, I think, is an indigenous word. Is, and Quebec is an indigenous word. And, and you know, I say sharing. It's, and then you could call it appropriation in many instances too. Yes. Um, but it, right. but uh, it's it's there, right? Okay. So I'm curious if all, let's say we've continued this process of reconciliation and what do you think maybe 20 years is too, too short-sighted? Like, let's say upon your deathbed (laughs) or even like, you know, generations later, what will Canada look like if true reconciliation has happened? Oh, geez. That's a great (laughs) question. I I think uh, what we're talking about sort of broadly is what are the limits of a of a third head of government in the country that hasn't really been recognized to date? Mm. Um, it, that is that is uh, when we know roughly what those limits are, and you'll never know exactly what they are. That's probably when we've reached a point of reconciliation, I guess. And I say we'll never know exactly what the limits are because it there there's always fight, like the province and the feds don't know exactly what the limits are between the two of them. They're still fighting about you know the details in these things. But uh, but that's the, I suppose maybe that's uh, what reconciliation looks like. What would it look like in more practical terms? Like what do you think that would like? That's kind of like a legal, almost like abstract. Hard oh, to- you okay? Like, like, what can what can the government do tomorrow? <laughs> no, I'm um, just curious to know what it might look like in terms of. Uh, you in, know. For BC, I'd I'd love to see the government admit admit possession of of in, like the fight that uh, many First Nations have about uh, Aboriginal title is you know prove it prove you own that bit. Now, now prove you own the bit beside it. And it's like, uh-huh. how do you do that? That's really difficult. Proving land ownership is difficult. And it's it's kind of silly because, of course, they they would have used all the things that available that they're disposable. They were people, right? People take advantage of things like uh, idle hands, you know, or the devil's play thing. People just start doing stuff in their spare time. So, of course, they would have, uh, you know, made a living from their lands. You don't have to prove that they use that tree. Of course, they. you can just assume they would have. That would be a big step forward, uh, I think, uh, uh, for the province and for relations. We were talking about wins earlier. I know um, 
I think a, a quiet success was Jody Wilson Raybould when she was the Attorney General. The federal government had a new directive on uh, litigation with Aboriginal peoples that I think, you know, did away with some of the more contentious and uh, disrespectful things that lawyers could have argued if they wanted to in front of a judge, which is sort of a nice, you know, credit to this federal government for that um, and their and their former Attorney General. Yeah. I mean, what else? E- easy sort of things. What's, what would be another big step forward? We could do what we do in the states. So the American states have an interesting relationship where when there's a lawsuit that involves a band in America, the federal government usually comes in on the same side as the band suing a state. Mm. Um, whereas in Canada, that's not the case. Generally, uh, lawsuits are pit the First Nation against the province and then the federal government just kind of sits there and doesn't participate super much. <laughs> But it'd be great if if this federal government copied what the Americans do and came in on the side of the bands. Oh, um, that would be a big help for for First Nations across the board. It would be it would be it would be a significant policy change. But it's not without precedent, right? They do it in the states. What's preventing it? Oh, I have no idea. I've never. I, I would love to meet the attorney or uh, minister of justice. I think it is federally. I'd love to meet them and ask. <laughs> <laughs> I'm wondering, and I know we're wrapping up soon, but I'm wondering whether it has anything to do with the fact that the federal government seems to be quite, you know, kind of rubbing shoulders with industry, like the ext- extractive industries, and be kind of benefiting from a lot of those activities. Uh yeah. I mean. I feel like uh, Canadian governments have always rubbed shoulders. I mean, industry and government; those are those relations go back hundreds of years. Mm. Um, I, I think there's always an element uh, or the risk of sort of double speak from government. I think there's lots of rhetoric that gets thrown around. I mean, Undrip. We haven't talked about Undrip. That's a no. great example. How did we of, have uh, Undrip? <laughs> yeah, a great example of of um, powerful rhetoric that doesn't necessarily, I think, mean that much on the ground. Let's let's uh, break down Undrip quickly for our listeners, just to so huh. know what it is. Quickly, yeah. So UNDRIP stands for the United United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. I think it's been, quote unquote, adopted in local legislation everywhere in the country. I think every province and the federal government, the federal government in BC definitely have uh, UNDRIP legislation. It's a very topical concept. I think it's a very powerful, I think it's a good document and it's very powerful rhetorically. Um, I'm skeptical that it has any pull in court. There's at least one judge who disagrees with me in Quebec. Um, well, that's good. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. No, totally. But there's also a couple decisions from British Columbia that go the other way and say this is not that useful. Uh, there are no legal hooks in it. It, it, it We don't know. Uh, this is something that, that'll probably work its way up the courts and we'll see lots of litigation over. But I, I'm a bit of a cynic as to its value. And I think that it has a lot of pull sort of rhetorically, politically, but doesn't actually do that much on the ground. And it's a good example of government saying reconciliation and then not actually doing reconciliation. <laughs> But is there a sense of hope, at least in the judiciary, that as these and these court cases continue to come up, and so is Wet'suwet'en or uh, LaRoe that's come out recently and all that. So do you at least have a sense of like hope that we'll kind of slowly get there and maybe UNDRIP will eventually? Oh, totally. It's uh, like a North Star. I can't speak for the uh, judiciary for sure, but uh, but these are this is progress. The, the, there's this is moving forward. Just just pushing these questions is progress. I think. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, it will, like it, there will be losses for First Nations in courts in the future. Like absolutely, and that is that'll be part of reconciliation. But even even these losses, I think, are important because you're you're forcing the question, you're pushing the law forward, you're helping us know where the boundaries are. Mm-hmm. Um, that, that ends up being good for everybody. I think. Yeah. Um, now, of course, it's even better when the when the Aboriginal ban wins, <laughs> yeah. when the right wins. But, it, but uh, it sounds like what I'm picking up on in, in your concept of reconciliation is that it does not mean we just go with whatever the ban says. Reconciliation seems to have a lot of compromise. Totally. It, it goes both ways. Yeah. It, it, um, it, um, this isn't... Uh, and this is, I think, a common misconception is it's not a zero sum game. It's not like uh, recognizing Aboriginal rights is removing rights from other people. There, there, There is a way for this to sort of succeed for everyone. And reconciliation is a two way street, right? It's about both sides coming together. It's not just one side. Now, obviously, there's there's a very one sided history for the last hundred years, but it, it takes two to reconcile, right? So, hmm. and yeah, it'll be a long process. And it, it is, uh, we are in the process of, you know, the, the, the subjugated party for the last 150 years is is pushing back. That's the hardest. That's the harder thing to do, right? Um, mm. Is to is to stand up after you've been held down for a long time. So, mm. 
Yeah. Okay. So last question. So who or what in your line of work really inspires you? Oh, absolutely. Uh, the clients, um, all the time. It, it's, there are times when I think it's amazing that you will find a community who's willing to reach out to help. I mean, there's no shortage of, you know, there, there, there were lots of losses in courts for First Nations. I think a lot of First Nations are gun shy um, about going to court because it's usually a, a European, you know, a colonial judge or a, a settler mm-hmm. judge sitting behind the bench. Not not that they're, you know, bad people and not doing the best job they can, but I can understand how a, a First Nation would be hesitant to sort of engage in that realm. And, and I, I think I'll, I take a lot of inspiration from the leadership in these communities, the weight of some of the decisions that these folks have to make, both for their sort of, you know, immediate communities and their sort of broader rights. These are these are difficult things, and it takes a lot of leadership, and it's amazing meeting people who who do it. Are you allowed to name them just to kind of call out? Oh! <laughs> uh, <laughs> kind of give them uh, like claps, you know? Shout out. I mean, it, I'd give a lot of credit to New Chalet. I actually think this, they've they've shown a lot of restraint, which I think has been really intelligent on their mm-hmm. part. It's been very strategic. And also, yeah, for, for sure to shoot for the stars. So great. Okay, Owen, I think that's time. So thank you so much for joining me. And thank you for our listeners for sticking with us all the way to the end. I hope you enjoyed this conversation. Hopefully you learned something interesting. And uh, thanks again. Yeah, cool. No, thanks for having me. It was great. Hi there, Connor Curtis, Head of Communications with Sierra Club Canada, just jumping in to do the Q&A for this episode. So the Q&As are not connected to the episode in any way. They don't reflect the views of our guests. It's just a chance for people to send in their questions to us on the environment and for us to answer them. And so we also encourage you, if you're listening, to send in your questions on the environment. And the question that we're going to be answering this week in the podcast is... Alberta drains raw sewage from lagoons into our lakes. What bacteria and viruses are present? So I reached out to our Prairie chapter and got their feedback on this, and I'm going to share what they have to say. It's going to be a bit more general because really in order to answer this question in a meaningful way, we would need to know more specifics about exactly where is being talked about and and what sort of sewage is being uh, drained. And so, but here's what the prayer chapter did have to say of this generally. And I am inviting a person who asked a question or maybe people listening in with the specific issue to write in and, and give us more specifics and we'll be able to get a more precise answer. But nonetheless, here's what the prayer chapter had to say. In Alberta, municipalities are supposed to treat wastewater. The province might have some jurisdiction regarding monitoring standards, but one would need to look at a more level, local level to assess the situation. Raw sewage can't be simply dumped into water bodies by major city centers, and it shouldn't be regardless of the size. The city of Calgary has an extensive treatment process and decontaminates the wastewater to mitigate risk. Smaller cities and towns are still required to treat their wastewater, but depending on where this is and the available funds and other factors like aging infrastructure, some treatment plants have differing abilities to treat waste. Certain biological controls require more advanced processes than smaller municipalities have the capacity to do. This is likely a common issue and speaks to a wider issue of funding for rural treatment plants and upgrades. That being said, the water coming from these plants is still supposed to be treated and some, in some capacity and should not be raw. Of course, there is always risk and processing could be imp- always be improved, for instance on the, the nutrients contained in raised water. There are stories of, for example, older septic tanks around some lakes in Saskatchewan that aren't maintained and pose a risk to, of leakage. But again, that's a very local situation. Regarding what viruses you might find, E. coli is a bacterium that can be found in water bodies that receive wastewater, but not all strains are virulent or cause harm. It can also come from waste from cattle, so even agricultural waste could be a possible contaminant. Again, in order to dive more into, you know, specifically what viruses and bacteriums we're talking about in this case, we need to know a bit more about the situation. I recognize this is a very general overview to your question. We need more specifics on what's happening locally in order to look into this in depth. And I want to say, please do feel free to follow up with us. You can send us your Q&A questions for us to answer during an upcoming podcast episode at info at sierraclub.ca. A reminder also that you can take action on environmental issues by visiting sierraclub.ca. We have tons of petitions, other actions and events, and regular news updates you can sign up for on the homepage. You can also find Sierra Club Canada on social media, and you can listen to the Environment in Canada podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio, and YouTube, or wherever you get your podcasts. 
This podcast also airs on CKUT Broadcast Radio in Montreal, 90.3 FM, bi-weekly on Tuesdays at 11 a.m. ET. Don't forget to click follow or subscribe so you get the latest episodes from us.